I was actually on the selection committee. I was on the board at World Vision, and it was tasked to me and a couple others to find the new president. And when we got down to just a few people, there were a couple other uh, candidates who were like pastor types. Rich walked in out of uh, his corporate background, and I felt his spirit. I knew, I knew, I don't always know this kind of stuff, but I knew within 15 minutes of that interview that this was God's man. And I knew what it was going to cost him, and I was worried that he wouldn't pay the price, and it felt like such an incredible match of what God had prepared him his whole life you know, to do, to step into this, but uh, most people who climb like Rich climbed want to keep climbing. Most people who have the resources that Rich had want to just multiply them for their own purposes and not move into this uh, other kind of life. And uh, I started praying like crazy after that initial interview with Rich that he would say yes. I, I felt that God was, was uh, in that. By God's grace, he did say yes. He's been the president of World Vision for uh, over 10 years now. He's taken it from $400 million raised to serve the poor to a billion one hundred million dollars in 10 years. And this is... Uh, He's just one of the absolute finest leaders I've ever met. And every time I get to be with him, my wife Lynn is on the board of World Vision now, and, uh, but every time we get to be together, I, I kid him you know, about the day that we had the interview and uh, about the irony of uh, fine china and then putting uh, food into the hands of starving children. But Rich, uh, real quick be, uh, before we wrap up here, uh, you, you really get this water thing. We've, we've been trying to educate our congregation yeah. a little bit of, about the need for clean water. I mean, you have seen it 10 oh, times yeah. more than I have. You spend half your life uh, on the field in these situations. Just give us your quick take on how important clean water is. Well, you know, in Africa, they say, they don't say water is important to life. They say water is life. And... Um, I've seen communities where literally uh, before clean water comes in, 30% of the children are dead before their fifth birthday. And most of that is waterborne diseases that could have been prevented. You bring clean water into that community and you can cut the mortality rate literally in half, uh, overnight, overnight. I was in a school at, in Ghana where, where World Vision had drilled wells and there was a, a borehole right next to the school and the headmaster stood there and told me, uh, five years ago, before we had clean water, I had 40 students in this school. Today, I have 400. Why? Because the children were fetching water every single day, walking miles with heavy buckets to bring this dirty, polluted water so their family could drink. Now, think about, you had tap water this week and beans and rice, but imagine if you got up tomorrow and there was no tap water in your house. There was no water, no washing machines, no dishwashers. Your life, your entire life would become a quest for water so that your family could live for another day, could live for another day. And I could take away many things from your lives. I could take away your automobiles. I could take away your big screen TVs. I could take away your iPods. Uh, I could shrink your house in half. I could cut your salary in half. I could take away your education. You would still survive, and you'd probably do okay. But if I take away water, I take away everything. I take away your dignity. I take away your health. I take away your ability to support your family and to keep your kids healthy. You've lost everything. That's how important water is. Yeah. And uh, Rich, I'm going to talk to them about your book in just a second. But uh, I want you to give a challenge to Willow. Yeah. I mean, you, you see stuff that most of us will never see. You, you know and love Willow. You've been in partnership with yeah. us on a lot of projects. So this is your shot. Yeah. What would you say to Willow? Well, you know, my book, the title of my book is called The Hole in Our Gospel. And the question on the cover is, what does God expect of us? And uh, I like dangerous questions, because uh, I've been at the other end of dangerous questions in my life. And I ask a lot of questions in that book, but uh, I would ask of Willow, what does God expect of you, individually, first of all? Is it just about going to church? Is it just about 
reading Christian books, being involved in Bible studies, avoiding all of the worst terrible sins, is that what God expects, that we just try to insulate ourselves and drown ourselves in Christian messages and books, or does God expect more? I ask another question, what gospel have we embraced? What gospel have we embraced? Have we embraced a diminished and shrunken gospel that's just a private transaction between me and God? It's a transaction like buying a fire insurance policy that if, if I pray the sinner's prayer and accept God's forgiveness, my sins are forgiven and I can just go back to the party, whatever party I was at. Is that the gospel that we've embraced? Or have we embraced the bold vision of Jesus Christ? The gospel is supposed to be good news. And Jesus said, I've come to preach the good news to the poor. I've come to lift up the brokenhearted. I've come to restore sight for the blind, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to release the captives, to stand up for justice. That gospel was meant to be a social revolution that would change the world. When Jesus said we were to be salt and light in the world, he had a revolution in mind that the world would be changed forever by those who claim to follow Christ. So my challenge to Willow is another question. Could one church change the world? Could one church change the world? 2,000 years ago, 12 men changed the world forever. I believe it can happen again, starting right here. Okay. I think we'll accept that challenge. <laughs>